Hello, I'm Dr. Ed Geringer, and I'd like to welcome you to CSC ECE 506, Architecture of Parallel Computers. In this course, we have five learning objectives. The first one is to understand the problem of race conditions in concurrent systems. If you have a serial program, it carries out operations in exactly the order that the programmer specified. But if you have multiple threads or multiple processes working at the same time, you don't know whether one of them is going to get ahead of the other one, and they need to synchronize their accesses to make sure that when one of them writes a variable and the other one needs to read it, that the one that writes it actually does the writing before the other one does the reading. And that's a race condition. Secondly, we'd like to learn how to decompose a program for parallel execution. Some of the variables in a multi-process program will need to be shared between the different processors or threads because they're used for communication. But other variables, like loop control variables, will be private to an individual processor. Looking at a program and learning to identify which are private and which are shared is goal number two of the course. The third goal is to be able to write simple parallel programs in the important programming models. And there are three important models. The first is shared memory programs. Threads share memory. One can read and one can write, and another can write to the same location. There's me message passing, in which any data that needs to go from one process to another needs to be sent by the first process and then received by having the second one execute a receive operation. And thirdly, data parallel, where you have a single instruction stream, but many data items being worked on at the same time. And that's uh, a GPU as an example of that. Fourth, we want to understand the operation of common cache coherence protocols, both bus-based and network-based. You know that for fast reference, any architecture will put recently referenced data in a cache, which is a small, fast memory, and then uh, the processor, the next time it needs it, can get it from the cache and doesn't need to go to main memory. But if you have multiple processors sharing data, that data needs to be coherent in the cache. In other words, if one processor changes that data element, that change needs to be reflected in all of the other processors that have it cached. And arranging that is the job of the cache coherence protocol. In a small system, you can use a bus-based protocol because all of the processors share a single bus. But in a larger system, that's not going to be the case. And then you need to use very different protocols to make sure that variables get updated as they should. But that's not the only problem in referencing memory. You also have the situation that in a large multiprocessor, it takes time for references to get from one processor over here to the data that they're accessing somewhere else. And you need to make sure that those actions, that that time that it takes, doesn't cause memory operations to be seen out of order at different sites. For example, if I write variable A, and then many instructions later, I write variable B, but the write to A gets caught up in network traffic and the write to B arrives first, then the program may work incorrectly. So a memory consistency model is supposed to avoid that. Now our textbook for the course is Fundamentals of Parallel Multicore Architecture by Jan Solahin. Jan was a professor of ECE for many years at NC State, and he left to start a new program at the University of Florida, I think it was two and a half years ago. But before he did that, he wrote a textbook on what we had been teaching in 506 for the last 10 years. And that's the book. There's an old edition for 2009 and a new edition from 2016. I encourage you to get the 2016 edition because the 2009 edition is missing material for maybe 20% of the classes this semester. Now, this is going to be an asynchronous online class, which means you don't need to come to class. You can do everything asynchronously by watching videos. 
But nonetheless, we will have sessions in Zoom Monday, Wednesday at 3 p.m. And if you want to find out where in Zoom, go to the course website at the location I gave you. And then over on the left, um, the location I emailed you, and then over on the left, there's a menu that where, where there's an entry that points to Zoom lectures. So what are we going to do in these sessions in Zoom, considering it's an asynchronous class? Well, first of all, I will take questions that you have submitted through the Google form on the course schedule page for each lecture. So uh, here is the course schedule page entry for lecture two, which will be next Monday. And it shows you that we have four videos to watch and then there's one that's just for your general knowledge about how people learn. And then we have a form where you can submit questions on lecture two and at the beginning of class next Monday, I will go over those questions. I'll also play the videos for the day from the YouTube playlist. And there will be a YouTube playlist for the videos each day. And while the videos are playing, I will answer questions in the chat. Now, if you want to ask a question orally, you can speak up and do that. And I'll stop the video from playing and answer your question. I want to have you have want to give you a lot of opportunity to interact with me and get clarification on what might not be clear from the videos themselves. But there's no requirement to actually come to class. If you want, you can submit your questions online and then not come to class, but later on watch the recording of the class and find out the answers to your questions. So uh, we want to allow you to do the class at your own speed and we also want to let you to work uh, work a couple of weeks ahead in case you have something big coming up and you want to get ahead in front of it you know like maybe the the, the career fair or something in February okay so you don't have to attend the videos in class but what you do have to do okay so before I get into that I want to show you a uh, play pause it because that's the way that we're going to interact with the videos during class. It's, been, it's, a, it's a resource that's been around, I don't know, for about 10 years, but this is the first time that it's become a resource at NC State. So I want to show you how we're going to be using it, and here's a video that explains that. Taking notes as a student on a Play Posit video bulb. If you need to take notes on the video that you're watching, click on the sidebar icon and then on the Notes tab. Type your note into the bottom of the Notes tab and click the blue icon next to it to save your note. Each note you make will also save a clickable timestamp that you can use to jump back or forward to the point in the video when you made that note. You can also download a text file of your notes by clicking on the gray download icon at the top of the Notes tab. Note you need to be aware that teachers can see the notes that you save. In the video, when you reach an interaction, the video will pause and the interaction will pop up on the screen. To complete the interaction, answer the question and click Submit to continue. You should see a toast in the upper right-hand corner of the screen telling you if your answer was submitted successfully. If the interaction allows, you may also see highlighting or may be feedback on your selected answer choices. If an interaction covers up an important part of the screen, you can hide the question by clicking the X in the top left corner of the interaction. If you want to make the interaction larger, however, click the arrow in the top right corner of the interaction. Hopefully these note-taking and interaction tips will help enrich your PlayPosit experience. The only thing I don't like about PlayPosit is the way they have the screen framed in Carolina blue. Now I should mention that the quizzes that we have in the videos are not actually graded. That means if you get the answers wrong, it's okay. It doesn't count against you. It's only necessary that you actually complete the quiz. Now uh, there's going to be a quiz in each of the 26 class sessions. For the, uh, for, for the, for the um, first class session, instead of a quiz on the videos, there's a quiz on the syllabus. Um, but all the rest of them have quizzes on the videos. You are required to do all of the 
26 class sessions, except that you can skip one of each without penalty. In other words, you can skip one of the, one of the quizzes in the videos, one of the quizzes on the reading before the videos, but they don't have to be skipped in the same class. So, you can, so we're going to count 25 out of 26 for, uh, for both video quizzes and reading quizzes. And actually, I'm going to try to set it up so that you can choose whether to do the reading first or the video first. Currently, it's set up so everybody does the, the reading first, followed by the video. And I'm going to try to get it so you can opt in to, to doing the video before the reading. In any case, the deadlines for the quizzes will be two days off. In other words, if, we have, uh, if, if you have a reading quiz to do, the reading quiz will be due the day of the class. In other words, the next one will be due on Monday, the one for Lecture 2. And then the video quiz, the quiz embedded in the video, will be due two days later. If we get it set up so you can do the video quiz first, then that for you will be due on the day of the lecture, and the reading quiz will be due two days later. I think if I were going to do this, I'd probably watch the videos first, and we're just working with Moodle and PlayPosit to see if we can get that to work, and if we can, I'll let you know, and I'll let you know, know that you can opt in to doing the videos first and then the readings. Okay, so I hope that was clear. If you don't do the quizzes you're supposed to, for each one not passed, you lose 0.5% on your semester average. So if you skipped both the reading and the video for a particular class, then you'd lose 1% from your semester average. For a quiz, um, for, for, for a reading quiz, in order to pass it, you need to get a score of at least 80%. For a video, to pass it, you just need to answer all the questions, whether the answers are right or wrong. We're not counting that this semester. Maybe in later semesters we will, but right now it's just, it's just graded based on completion. Okay, so I should mention that the... Um, the le oh. Okay, well, it looks like there's a mistake here. Uh, it is, in fact, the, the true that the syllabus quiz will be due on Friday, but I just told you that the Lecture 2 quiz will be due next Monday, and so, in fact, it will be due on Monday. Okay? But remember, the syllabus quiz is going to be due on Friday. For later classes, deadlines will be two days apart. That is, the thing you do first will be due on class day, and then the other one will be due two days after that. Okay, so... That was the requirement for keeping up with material. There's also a requirement for working with other students. There are going to be five, uh, five assignments this semester where you can work with another student, where you can work as a team. You can pair uh, with them for programming assignments or the peer-reviewed exercise I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, but you need to pair with three other students during the semester. So. We'll have it set up so you can ask in Piazza for partners, and um, if you can't find a partner, let me know, and I'll help you find a partner. But uh, you want to par partner with different people each time, and the reason for that is you learn something from everybody that you work with. So for each partner, short of three that you are in the semester, your semester average is docked by 2%. So please, um, uh, you know, partner with at least three people. The other two assignments you could do by yourself, but for three of them anyway, you should work with another student, which I think will be less work, and you'll learn from discussing the assignment with the other student. Okay, so here's the homework for the semester. There are going to be four programs, three problem sets, and one peer-reviewed exercise, and together they add up to 50%. The tests also add up to 50%. The first one is 10% of your grade, second one 15%, and the final exam 25%. The reason for doing it that way is it sometimes takes people time to get acclimated to the way we run exams. And that way, if you don't do well in the first exam, 
it doesn't count against you very much. I should mention that we're going to be doing exams in grade scope this semester online, and I'm going to use a plagiarism detection program that's kind of a feature that's built into grade scope, as well as using um, as well as using Respondus Monitor. But it's probably not going to look at the at the monitor output very often. It's just if we think something suspicious about the answers. Okay, so uh, the homework: four programs, three problem sets, and one peer-assessed exercise. Uh, the programs will be. Uh, the first two are going to be parallel programs. The last two are going to be simulations of cache coherence. The three problem sets will be spaced out over the course of the semester uh, just on material that we cover in class. And these won't be questions from the textbook. They'll be new questions for which you can't find the answers online. And then I want to talk a little bit about the peer assessed exercise. The, for the peer assessed exercise, uh, you can make up a problem that's like the ones we give you for homework and submit it. And then some of your fellow students will review it and give you suggestions. And then you can go revise your problem and submit it. And they'll come back and give you a final grade, which I'll look at, but I won't count it. I'll decide if I agree with them. And then I'll assign you another grade. So that's the way made-up problems work. Another thing you can do is you can improve the play posit experience that we have for some lectures. So if you don't, if you think you could do better than the quiz that we have in one of the play posit videos, you can do a new play posit, play posit. They call it a bulb, a new play posit uh, uh, bulb for an existing lecture. And if that's good enough, you can get credit for that too. So we want to improve the, 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 the interactions that we have online. And you can help do that. OK? The tests, two, uh, two hour midterm tests. And because of the fact it's two hours, we'll probably have to set up an evening time for them so that, it's a, so that it doesn't conflict with other classes. Then we'll have a 150-minute final exam. And everything will be open book and open notes, but no computers other than the one you're taking it on. And no communication devices will be allowed. So that's the rules. And we'll basically figure out what we need to figure out by looking at your answers. Okay, So I've talked about the homework. I haven't yet talked about the extra credit. General rule that I have for extra credit in any of my classes is that all activities for which extra credit is given must help other students to learn the course material. So I have some examples here. First is contributing useful practice problems via Peerwise. Peerwise is a system that was set up for students to uh, come up with sample test questions and give them to other students to work on. And um, we'll set that up about a week before each of the exams. Now, that's totally voluntary. If you don't want the extra credit or don't need to study for the exam, you don't need to do it. But if you do it, you can earn extra credit for your contributions. The system keeps track of how many people work, how many people work your problems, and how many people got it right, and whether your answer is deemed by the class to be the correct answer. So you can get credit for contributing useful practice problems. Second, you can get credit for doing extra peer reviews of this peer assessed exercise, be it made up problems or play posit bulbs. And that, those will be submitted to our expertise of peer assessment system, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the semester. You can also suggest web or print resources that will help other students make up useful made up problems or bulbs. There will be a way for doing that. If you don't want to make up a problem yourself, but you saw a really good one that somebody might want to emulate, not copy, but emulate, uh, then you can get extra credit for that. And you can also get extra credit for making outstanding contributions to answering other students' questions on Piazza. 
uh, you can get credit for being in the top students in the class in terms of number of questions answered, number of questions that the staff recognizes as good questions, and number of questions that or number of answers that we tag as good answers. So lots of ways to get extra credit. Okay, so I said I wanted to talk, talk a little bit about the course, want to talk a little bit about myself. That is my family. A family picture was taken last winter. And I often say that my family is the second most important thing to me in life after my faith in Jesus Christ. I am one of the core group of our Christian Faculty Staff Fellowship at NC State. Uh, the fellowship sponsors ads in the technician several times a year. And last year, for the first time, we had a combined Thanksgiving and Christmas ad because classes ended at Thanksgiving. So this is it. You can read a little bit about the Christian origins of both holidays. Now, normally, if this were a face-to-face -face semester, I would invite you to the Bridges Lunch, which is... Uh, which is uh, run by another Christian ministry on campus. And it's, uh, it's uh, Friday uh, at uh, 12.30 typically, but we're not having it this semester because of the pandemic, but I hope to see you there next fall. Okay, so that's me. And the rest of the staff is TAs, and we're really blessed to have two TAs, both who have TA'd the course before for me, and both who have done a really good job. There's Chi Zhao and Ramnik Bansal, and they will be assisting me with the course. If you want to email the staff, now you can always post on Piazza, but if you want to email the TAs and me, then the address is below, CSCECE 506 Berg 2021 support at wolfware.ncsu.edu. I don't know why they couldn't spell out spring, but you got to remember that the abbreviation is SPRG. Okay, so I would say if you're sending a question that you'd like an answer to and you're pretty sure it's not going to be of interest to the rest of the class and you don't need to do it anonymously, then you can email it to us. But if you think it's going to be of interest to the rest of the class, I encourage you to ask it on Piazza. And if you think it might be a stupid question and don't want me to know who you are, but you don't really need to worry about that. But if you did, you could post it anonymously on Piazza. So you have lots of ways to contact us, and I hope we can be of benefit to you throughout the semester.